So I'm uh, Albrecht schulte and I'm uh, hosting this symposium on zoos and aquariums moving forward, history, politics, and science. Um, I'd like to uh, first welcome uh, all of our speakers. Uh, Dan Vander Summers, can you raise your hand so people know. <laughs> Andrea Olive, uh, Trevor Pitcher, and Elena Diego. Um, so uh, first I'd like to just thank um, some of our supporters. So Laurentian University has support, is supporting the symposium with some uh, funds and of course with organizing it. Um, much of what we are going to talk about today will be uh, covered, or not what we will talk about, the costs associated with some of the work that we're doing today, you're talking about today, it's covered by our SHIRT grant with an aid to small universities grant that we've got that's, going, that's covered uh, the travel costs for all of our speakers. Um, I also need to acknowledge our patron, Tom Fenske and his family who uh, over there, Tom, you can raise your hand please. Tom uh, donates to the university through his, uh, as, uh, as a good citizen of the university, as an employee of the university, and he has had those funds directed towards our research center. So um, he is another reason why we're here. Um, this is also organized by the Center for Evolutionary Ecology and Ethical Conservation, which is a group of us uh, that combine uh, our combined uh, humanists and scientists that uh, uh, work together on questions related to conservation. Uh, and these include people like, like myself, David Les Barrera, who's not here, but uh, Brett Buchanan, who's here, is an environmental philosopher who's part of our group. Um, the the our research center, which we call SEEK, um, started off with uh, a really great symposium that we put together about five years ago called Thinking Extinction, and it brought together <coughs> humanity scholars and scientists to talk about um, the philosophy and science of endangered species conservation. And in that sort of vein, uh, we have today's uh, symposium, which brings together people with different disciplines to talk about questions related to zoos and, their, and the conservation work that they do. So zoos have a, just to, as a, a way of introduction, um, I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about zoos and talk a little bit about uh, this graduate training program that we do uh, related to zoos uh, called Renew Zoo. So the first, of course, the question is about zoos. What, what are zoos? What do they do? And, and this, actually, this image of um, a thylacine, a Tasmanian wolf, is sort of em, uh, emulate, or it's, uh, it shows us what's wrong with zoos in many ways in terms of our perspective of zoos. So this is a an extinct marsupial car, uh, uh, predator. It is. Uh, it died out. The last one died, and you're a historian, Dan, so you correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> but from my reading, uh, the last one died in a zoo. Uh, its keeper had, uh, I guess the door to its uh, pen had uh, closed, and so it was left outside overnight, and it died because of exposure. And so, um, that's the last of the thylacine, right? And so this is the story of zoos, right? Putting animals on display and yet not, at the time anyway, not necessarily caring for them as well as they could have. Um, and this is sort of part of the historical reality of zoos when we talk about them today. But of course, now we have a much broader and different perspective in terms of captive animals and, and putting them on display. This is the, um, a, a fantastic image from um, the uh, strategic uh, plan for the Toronto Zoo. And you'll note that there is a huge emphasis on, on animal welfare and animal care in terms of their mission, uh, and also an emphasis on, on wildlife health, whatever that word health might mean, and uh, saving species. So if you look at the bottom right, they have a whole sort of component of their strategic plan associated with conservation and saving species in their habitats. So the modern zoo then has a very different perspective. And that is that they are, uh, a modern zoo is moving towards being sort of an environmental NGO that's functioning in terms of uh, conservation and engaging in research and education in conjunction with that. So we um, at Laurentian, at the Center for uh, Evolutionary Ecology and Ethical Conservation, we are leading a program that's funded by an NSERC Create grant called Renew Zoo. This is a graduate training program that we've initiated and uh, part of like what this uh, symposium is meant to do is to introduce you to this program in some way. And so uh, Alana is speaking to us last here and she's gonna speak a little bit to the experience that she had as part of this Renew Zoo program and talk about her research as a graduate student as part of it. Um, 
So uh, Renew Zoo is a, uh, composed of a group of uh, researchers, many of them based here at Laurentian, but also including people like Trevor Pitcher, who's speaking at, from Windsor, uh, but also people from Trent, from UBC, UCAM, uh, Calgary, and uh, Trent University, as well as Simon Fraser University, which is where Alana did her work. Um, and the idea here is that we are partnering with a collection of uh, research intensive institutions, zoos and aquariums across Canada. And our graduate students that are part of this program, and you'll see who they are in a minute, um, all are engaged in some way with research with these institutions. Um, so here they are, the students doing various types of work, working on turtles, working on uh, endangered species, uh, various aspects of captive breeding and so on, doing field, field work. Um, all in collaboration. So they're, the, the key here is that they are uh, working in collaboration with zoos. They're getting an academic education at, a gra at the graduate level at the universities, but they are also engaging in conservation-oriented work with the zoos as part of their thesis. So Renew Zoo is a program that focuses on conservation, on training of graduate students uh, in the zoo and aquarium context. Um, the, the idea here is to train students that deal with issues related to zoo conservation, but also are, at least in part, dealing or um, trained in areas related to ethics and education. So we have many people working with us that are engaged in training some of these students, many of the students in ethics and so on. And so, um, and Dan's gonna speak a little bit to some of the stuff related to philosophy and sort of animal studies and so on that, uh, that, we're, that the students have, are, that we're trying to get the students to learn about. So just really quickly, the students are doing a thesis. They do a four-month internship at a zoo or aquarium. Um, there's an online course that we just de delivered for the first time last fall that the stu graduate students take. Uh, we have an, on an annual uh, meeting that takes place in conjunction with CASA, which is the Canadian, what's Canada's, uh, how's it go? Canada's accredited zoos and aquariums. Um, so this is the national organization for zoos that have, they have an accreditation process. And then at the end, the students uh, are to receive a certificate in zoo conservation, which is recognized by CASA. These are our students. So a collection of them, we have about nine right now with a number of others coming in uh, down the pipe. Um, many of them, I guess Josh's head is a bit covered there, unfortunately. Um, these students are both MSc and PhD students working most of them, uh, many of them with the Toronto Zoo, but also with other institutions, uh, including, for example, the uh, Insectarium in Montreal, uh, what else do we got? Uh, Calgary Zoo, Toledo Zoo, and, um, and the Vancouver Aquarium. So yes, yeah, so we have a website, renewzoo.ca, and so I encourage you to take a look and see what the program's all about and to see who the, who's involved in terms of, uh, of the work. All right. So I'm gonna introduce our first speaker. This is it here, right? So um, I, uh, m my intent was to uh, bring a historian um, to this symposium because uh, part of what we are teaching in this uh, online course to the zoo, uh, these uh, students in Renew Zoo, uh, in involves sort of giving them some kind of historical context for, for zoos. And so um, I, event I have to admit that Dan wasn't my first choice. My first choice is on sabbatical in in, in Italy, but having said that, apparently he's the, my first choice is not a terribly good speaker. So we're, you know, Dan is is, is the perfect person to be here with us. Dan is actually a, um, I, I, I ran Dan's work actually online, reading this um, this sort of this article he'd written for an online magazine, which was this, like actually wonderfully written a description about the history of zoos, and, and I used much of that material in this sort of introductory lecture that I did for this online course, and I try to track him down to invite him. And I had a hard time finding his email, and uh, but in the end, we, we got him here. Dan is uh, actually, he works um, or is with, associated with uh, the Consortium for History, Technology, and Medicine, which is based in Philadelphia. Uh, he is a postdoctoral fellow with the National Endowment uh, for the Humanities, so a very prestigious um, fellowship. Uh, his research in, is engaged in the history of zoos and the intersection between science, environment, and culture with respect to zoos. And uh, he has two books. Uh, one coming out imminently and one coming out fairly soon. So an accomplished scholar and, and super proud to have him here to talk to us about his work. So thanks. Well, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, 
before I start, the story I'm going to tell you is about bighorn sheep, and I stumbled upon this story completely by accident. I had no, um, I have no like uh, passion for bighorns ten years ago, but I was in the Smithsonian Institution where I've spent about eight years uh, researching zoo history and the history of biology, and I stumbled upon a box that was just labeled mountain sheep. Um, it wasn't categorized. There was no list with it. It wasn't on the official records. I opened up the box, and there were 900 letters about bighorns written between 1901 and 1904 um, in this box. Um, so this story comes uh, from those letters. In 1893, uh, this man, Frederick Jackson Turner, wrote a famous essay, The Significance of the Frontier in American History. He declared the American frontier closed. Supposedly, Americans had fulfilled their manifest destiny. Supposedly, Americans conquered the American West. <coughs> At the dawn of the 20th century, a nation supposedly rejoiced. The soft chorus of the farmer swaying grain, the percussion of the miner's pickaxe, the lowing timbre of the rancher's herds, and the falsetto of the conductor's whistle reached to the heavens. Yet, below this divine national cacophony, yet 9,000 feet above its acolytes, herds of North American bighorn sheep bleated an anthem of resistance, a song that reverberated through canyons and long precipices well into the 20th century. This story I'm going to tell is a story of and in zoo history. It's a story about a national government chasing sheep around the country for the purpose of zoological display. This is a story about the construction of zoological knowledge. It's a story about the building of the American West. And it's a story about the ironies of zoo conservation. This is also a story about storytelling. The following tale will call attention to the opportunities as zoos, animal history, and narrative history offer the historian, and in turn, what the animal historian and the zoo historian can offer to those working in wildlife biology, ecology, conservation, policy making, uh, et cetera, et cetera. As animals migrate from the margins of history to its main stage, though, they reveal paths hidden beneath the ones previously bla uh, blazed by historians. Uh, telling stories through and with animals can untangle historiography, it can untangle philosophy, showing how ideas and processes and actors can be pulled apart in brand new ways, making audible historical subjects that have been relegated to our silenced wildernesses of our past. Here, mountain sheep bleat. In this talk, I will show how topics as diverse as zoological knowledge, indeed the birth of zoology itself and the birth of zoological parks. Um, as well as federal, local, state power systems, conservation, extinction, the building of the American West, and the populating of the country are all tied into notions of animal resistance around 1900. Mountain sheep point us to threads unforeseen, and these threads stitch history together. Like the history of other first Americans, though, the history of North American mountain sheep must begin on the frozen ice of Beringia, the name given to the land bridge that connected the Americas to Eurasia around 13,000 years ago. Even though these mountain sheep diverged from their Eurasian ancestors somewhere around 600,000 years ago, as Homo erectus was still perfecting the bipedalism and uh, undergoing the protein-stimulated brain growth that would make them human, these sheep would not become American until, until they stepped foot in northern Can Canada. This diaspora immediately migrated southward and quickly colonized the North American continent from northern Canada to northern Mexico. Today, zoologists generally recognize three species as offspring of this Ice Age diaspora. First, Ovis canadensis, the key characters of our story today. These colloquially are known as bighorn. Second, Ovis dolly, the white horned sheep of Alaska and northwestern Canada. And third, Ovis nivicola, also known as the Siberian snow sheep. Of these three, it is Ovis canadensis that sheeped most of North America. This species, like Homo sapiens sapiens, varies greatly from place to place, yet most scholars recognize three subspecies of, of Ovis canadensis. And there's a little bit of debate about their classification, but the three main subspecies are Rocky Mountain bighorn, Sierra Nevada bighorn, and the desert bighorn. But like the history of other first Americans, the 19th century chapter of Ovis canadensis is one of both persecution and survival. As history has demonstrated elsewhere, genocidal forces rarely succeeded in completely stamping out their other. Culture pro proves resilient, individuals always hang on, and a good portion of the literature about the American West narrates this process of extermination, exploitation, and extraction. And sheep, of course, fit into this narrative. 
However, like others, they fought back. The story I'm about to tell will show how native sheep resisted imperialism and how in so doing they tied together ideas, forces, and actors central to the history of the American West and the history of zoology. From an inverse reading of this same story though, this is a story about how zoos had far-reaching influence in shaping culture, science, and politics in the late 19th and early 20th century. Millennia before Europeans sailed westward, humans and sheep met in the mountains of Western North America. These interactions were surely dynamic, different in the Bitterroot Mountains than in the Black Hills or in the San Juan Mountains, different in the Wasatch Range than on the top of Mount Albert or along the Baja Peninsula. It is therefore difficult to generalize about the role of sheep in human cultures and humans in sheep cultures prior to European colonization. It can be assumed generally that the most developed sheep-human contact zone existed in the American Southwest, where Puebloan peoples had long interacted with mountain sheep because those mountain sheep were at lesser altitudes. Nonetheless, mountain sheep were surely most meaningful to humans in places where both lived, as evidenced by these ancient uh, pictogra uh, pictographs and petroglyphs in, in Utah. And if you ever travel in Utah, there's hundreds of these all over the state, and new ones are found uh, every single year. Even though sheep and humans long shared the North American continent, European colonization brought quick declines in sheep population. Indeed, mountain sheep were moved uh, along a rhetorical spectrum between the 17th and the 19th century. Moved from mysterious exotic on one side, through the marvelous possessions of the conquistadors, all the way to commodity by the 19th century. In 1697, we get the first European account of uh, bighorn sheep. Um, jotted down in a diary, and it was just called a remarkable species of sheep. Um, the, the doodle that this uh, Spanish explorer made just had these gigantic horns on a round body. In 1800, though, we get legitimate images. In 1800, Duncan McGillivray, an, uh, an explorer in the fur trading uh, Northwest Company, encountered an animal near Calgary that he said, quote, appeared to be a compound of the deer and the sheep, having the body and hair of the first, with the head and horns of the last. McGillivray's discovery, quote unquote, was quickly communicated to the Western world and coronated Bellier de Montan by Etienne Geoffrey St. Hilaire in 1803. Well, two years later, in 1805, Lewis and Clark met mountain sheep along the badlands <coughs> of the upper Missouri River. Representatives of the newly acquired Louisiana Purchase in the United States, it did not take long for these new national possessions to become international commodities. Robert Jameson, for example, professor of natural history in the, at the University of Edinburgh, also future teacher of Charles Darwin, proclaimed that upon, quote, examining the fleece, I was particularly struck with its uncommon fineness, and it occurred to me that an animal inhabiting the temperate regions of the Rocky Mountains with so valuable a fleece might be easily procured and readily introduced into this country and bred to form a valuable addition to the wool-bearing animals, end of quote. The proposed relocation and domestication never, of course, happened. But North American mountain sheep fascinated the entire world, especially their wool, their horns, and their mutton. Even though a century of scientists quibbled over their classification, no one who had laid eyes upon these American mammals questioned their uniqueness. They indeed stood on top of nature's throne, and sadly, ascendancy in so many other situations throughout history often leads to annihilation. Not only did mountain sheep make fine coats and delicious dinners and, and spectacular trophies to mount on your wall, they also spawned a voluminous, and I mean a voluminous popular literature in the United States in the 19th century. And just a few titles will tell the story. 1877, Bighorns or Rocky Mountain Sheep Surprised. Frank Leslie's Popular Monthly. 1881, Sheep Hunting in the Mountains, Little's Living Age. 1884, Stalking the Mountain Sheep, Forest and Stream. 1891, Capturing Rocky Mountain Sheep. These titles go on and on and on. There are literally hundreds of magazine articles in the 19th century for popular audiences about the mysteries of the bighorn. Even Mary Austin, poet and nature writer, wrote a poem about mountain sheep. The shepherd tends his foolish flocks along the mountain's hem, but free and far the wild sheep are, and God doth shepherd them. By 1895, William Temple Hornaday, a leading naturalist in the United States, 
famous for quote unquote saving the bison, lamented the demise of the mountain sheep that were disappearing forever. Others joined the dirge. German painter Karl Rungius, for example, inspired greatly by Hornaday, memorialized mountain sheep in this painting, The Mountaineers on Wilcox Pass, where Bighorn stood atop proudly the Alberta Rockies, looking to you, the viewer, asking you, why are you intruding on my mountainscape? Rungius's work might be best understood as an epitaph of sorts for a species that may vanish very soon. And it is here that zoo conservation begins. It is here that the ark begins. Later in the year of 1898, the zoo superintendent, Frank Baker, decided that the Smithsonian's National Zoological Park in Washington, DC, needed to keep the promise made a decade earlier before the halls of the Capitol. And namely, this promise is to preserve the, an the animals of North America. This mission would not be complete, he knew, until he could acquire Rocky Mountain sheep for the zoo. By the end of the 19th century, acquiring a zoological specimen seemed to be a fairly straightforward task. You locate a collector, you place an order, you wait a few weeks, and the animal arrives on your doorstep. Frank Baker knew this pro process very, very well. He did this with elephants and beavers and bison and elk and deer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He placed hundreds of orders. Indeed, all of the zoo's inhabitants that were not donated or loaned to the zoo were usually just acquired by finding a collector. Yet through a national network of specimen dealers, this, these animals were very available in the late 19th century. On March 1st, 1899, Baker made his order for mountain sheep. He wrote to Montana professor Morton J. Allrod, simply, I wish to obtain immediately a young Rocky Mountain lamb alive. Can you furnish one or inform me where to get one? And what's the price? Question mark. Answer collect. Clearly, he thought it, uh, locating a mountain sheep would be an easy task, just like any other animal. To cover his bases, though, Baker sent an identical telegram to Hunter R.W. Rock of Lake Idaho three days later. Even after following up with Elrod, with a longer, typed letter, Baker heard only silence in return. He then contacted more hunters and collectors. Vic Smith from Anaconda, Montana, a famous hotel owner in Colorado named Leonard M. Cotton. He hoped that one of these individuals would, would find a sheep for him. Both agreed to help the National Zoo, and the secretary of the Smithsonian, Samuel P. Langley, even sent Cotton the legal papers for a final agreement. Yet the whole year ended, 12 months, Three months of a new century has passed, and Baker was still without word of sheep, let alone a sheep itself. The secretary of the Smithsonian, Samuel P. Langley, chose a whole different route. Rather than emailing hotel owners and hunters, he, he wrote letters, not emailed, I don't know why that came out. He wrote letters to senators, governors, and Teddy Roosevelt. These senators, governors, and future presidents wrote him back saying, we'll get on it. And silence in return. Frank Baker, on the other hand, continued down the tangled footpaths of hunters, trappers, and collectors. He waited for good news from Elrod, Rock, Smith, and Cotton, yet once Langley began appealing to government officials, Baker decided it was time to hurdle himself down the skein of trails that tied the North American West together. Throughout the month of April, Baker reached out to Owen Swift of Edlaw, Perry Faust of Stevensville, Frank C. Parks of Ketchum, Frank Robinson of Libby, J. Blizzard of Eureka, H. Weeman of Midland, John Goff of Meeker, W. H. Root of Laramie, <laughs> the list goes on and on. He writes letters to 30 people looking for bighorn sheep. He scoured Colorado. He scoured Montana. He looked throughout Idaho, Wyoming, and North Dakota in the hope of catching one single Rocky Mountain <laughs> sheep. All the while, Langley was pursuing government officials in these states. When the Smithsonian secretary grouched at Baker for still not having acquired a single sheep, Baker just responds, the failure does not arise from the lack of effort, but from the fact that the sheep are exceedingly wary and almost impossible to capture. But very few have ever been in captivity, and those were caught by accident rather than by design. Rocky Mountain sheep had been pushed by a westbound nation to the edge of extinction, victims of bullets, disease, and dislocation, yet catching one alive proved to be a nearly impossible task. Baker would have to find the perfect man for the job. <coughs> One day in April, that man arrives in the doorstep of the National Zoo. You see the National Zoo up in the top of the frame. Um, it's just about 2.2 miles from the White House, which is in the bottom right. 
uh, of this frame. The man that arrives is Charles Jesse Buffalo Jones in 1900, who acquired quite the reputation as a frontiersman, as a hunter, as a cowboy. As a child, Jones met Abraham Lincoln when his father uh, hired him as his personal lawyer. He also knew American legends, Wyatt Earp, Pat Garrett, Buffalo Bill Cody. Buffalo Jones is the character of the Western story, the rise of the Western literature. He founded Garden City, Kansas. He served as its, as its first mayor. And most significantly for Frank Baker's purpose, Jones, alongside the zoo, fought to prevent the extinction of the American bison. He is a fitting symbol of the tangled turn of the century West. Jones proved quite the socialite for a frontiersman, quite the statesman for a cowboy. And as he and Baker meandered along the walkways of the zoo, sharing stories about wildlife, Jones convinced the superintendent that a mountain sheep cannot be obtained by just sending letters to hunters. He encouraged Baker to create a grand expedition. Mountain sheep were simply too elusive. Their capture would require great work. Less than a week later, the Smithsonian had organized such an expedition, and then as Jones' signature was drying on the contract, he headed west. A letter scribbled frustratingly, and you could see the frustration in the letter. June 19, 1900. I stayed in the mountains as long as there was hope of capturing a lamb, even a week longer, as they are as nimble as a fox when a week old. The old ewes take them up to the highest and roughest peaks as soon as they can travel, and even drop them far above where the old bucks and young sheep range. People see the sheep on the side hills and think to themselves, it is easy to get a lamb, but they know not a damn thing of the habit of these animals, end of quote. Another letter, three weeks later. You have no idea the difficulty in capturing the lambs. They go into the most difficult cliffs. My fingers are blistered with endeavoring to find their lair, end of quote. A whole year went by, and Buffalo Jones finally managed to capture two sheep. Yet they fell seriously ill immediately in Topeka, Kansas. Sheep in captivity were quite vulnerable to stomach and intestinal complications. Uh, sheep at low altitudes were vulnerable to apoplexy. After a narrow recovery, these two individuals were shipped to the zoo by train, but they both died on the train. The cause of death remained a mystery. The Texan who shipped the lamb said they succumbed to a cough, and maybe this is true. Animals get tuberculosis in train cars all the time, um, especially in trading centers before they're shipped out as well. Frank Baker, the zoo superintendent, said it was food poisoning. But Jones, after examining the bodies, suspected that one of the lambs died naturally, and the other became so lonesome that it beat itself to death upon the wall of the train car. And these uh, sort of suicidal episodes were quite common in, in the uh, literature or in the letters uh, concerning antelope and deer, and maybe in this case, sheep. Buffalo Jones, after a whole year, never successfully procured a living sheep. Famous hunter W.H. Root joked two years later that Jones had the consent of the gov governor of Colorado. He did not have the consent of the sheep. Even after the Smithsonian Institution forged a contract with Buffalo Jones, Frank Baker continued to fashion an extensive mountain sheep community across, across the Colorado Rockies. Clearly, catching Rocky Mountain sheep was not a simple assignment, and the zoo director built a safety network of sheep, sheep collectors. Even though in 1900 the Smithsonian refused to sign more contracts in order to minimize its financial risk, the National Zoo still agreed to purchase sheep from individual hunters, should they happen to find them on their own. Most of these contacts stretched across Colorado, Edlaw, Aspen, Manitow, Granite, Paonia, Denver, and, and uh, Eagle. Others hailed from Wyoming, Montana, New Mexico, Arizona, California, and Nevada. None caught sheep, however. By the late autumn of 1900, Frank Baker still believed that mountain sheep would, not, would be most easily captured in Colorado. And on the doorstep of the 1901 winter, he prepared to hire two more cowboys to try to capture sheep. This year, it was A.S. Sharp, and Samuel V. Moninger. Moninger located a herd right away, 45 sheep. The problem was that they were, quote, pretty well snowed in, one of the roughest canyons in the state, and they were cornered by two or three mountain lions. Moninger planned to kill the lions for his own safety, and then he used dogs to chase them down on the cliffs. However, dogs cannot catch bighorn sheep on rocky cliffs, and he learned this the hard way. Later in that winter, he tracked down a different herd, and since he could crawl undetected right up to the herd, he built this weird contraption. It was a box that he covered in branches, a booby trap of sorts, 
and he tried to lure the sheep into the booby trap so that he could catch them, but you can't catch a sheep with a box on a cliff, and he failed again. Sharp had no more luck than Moninger. He dis discovered a, a flock of fine sheep outside Leadville, Colorado, and he had four men after them steady. However, an impossible storm drove them from the mountains. Sharp, though, remains optimistic. If there is such a thing as getting them, we will have them, he writes. They are one of the hardest animals to capture. Yet despite doing all in his power, he came up empty-handed. Both hunters again fail. Catching mountain sheep was not an easy task. Just as Frank Baker began to widen his field of vision, a sheep emerged from an unlikely source. Baker learned that E.I. Schaefer of Eckert, Colorado, possessed a mountain sheep that he was willing to sell to the zoo. The sheep had been in captivity in western Colorado for nine months, and it was a very nice, healthy specimen, according to its owner. Even though the state game warden was determined not to let Baker have the sheep, with the influence of the Colorado senator and the lobbying of Buffalo Jones, who pleaded with the warden to allow a thorough test to domesticate a few, a permit was finally and begrudgingly granted. On June 24, 1901, the National Zoo receives its first bighorn. Like most zoo mammals, though, however, the mountain sheep needed a companion, and mam uh, zoo mammals often will, uh, will die early without a companion in its enclosure. Since Colorado sheep seemed impossible to catch, and since the Smithsonian seemed to have exhausted its favors with the state government, Frank Baker began to look elsewhere. In the summer of 1901, he forged a new policy for catching bighorns. No longer is he going to contract people to go after them. He is just going to stand ready to receive them from people who already have them. While Baker stood ready, he pushed his mountain sheep network across the entirety of Western North America, building the American West. Baker cast his network far and wide. First, he looked to the state of Montana. He formed relationships with three hunters there who agreed to pursue sheep. But Montana, Baker discovered, only issued permits for mountain sheep serving educational purposes within the state of Montana, not educational purposes elsewhere. Baker and Langley consequently appealed to the governor to grant the Smithsonian official sanction around Blackfoot. The request, however, was denied. Like Colorado, Montana had finally begun to take wildlife regulations seriously. Baker corresponded with collectors and hunters from Idaho Falls, Haley, Patterson, Small Idaho, and Langley with a collector from Aberdeen, South Dakota. He looked at Eddie, New Mexico. He looked at Salt Lake City, Utah. He looked at Elizabeth Lake, California, for Sierra Nevada bighorns. He looked at Parkman, Wyoming. The point here is clear. Baker searched high and low, I mean, well, mostly high for bighorn sheep throughout all of North America. Indeed, William Temple Hornaday, director of the New York Zoological Park and Baker's predecessor, encouraged him to look to Canada, where the white horned sheep lived at lesser altitudes and might be easier to catch anyway. Although these sheep would eventually be classified as a different species, Ovis dolly, they could still serve as representatives of the disappearing mountain sheep in, uh, of North America. He contacted sheep seekers in British Columbia. He courted a purse service steamer that ran between Seattle and Skagway, Alaska, who promised to catch this one type of sheep found on an island in an Alaskan inlet. Uh, he named it Ovis fanus. Bacon, Baker even pursued the possibility of catching sheep in Chihuahua, northwestern Mexico. These sheep were apparently in even graver danger uh, because of vacationing Parisians that would travel to Mexico just to shoot sheep, um, by the way. No matter where in North America, Frank Baker recruited hunters, trappers, collectors, and frontiersmen. Mountain sheep, though, resisted. They evaded the imperial appropriation that tethered elephants, fenced antelope, and caged monkeys. The elusive cultures they built on cliffs at the edge of human settlement proved virtually impenetrable. Joseph Chandler admitted to Baker that the goal is dangerous because sheep were only to be had on the peaks and seldom leave the precipices where they can't be caught. James Fullerton believed that common knowledge that the sheep was the most difficult of all game to ca capture. Winnie Harwood Phillips believed that the sheep know their safety lies in escaping to the tops of the waterless mountains. And Will Frakes declared Sierra Nevada bighorns the most cautious and suspicious animal that I have ever seen. Samuel V. Moninger the Smithsonian hunter. After trying to catch these uh, damned sheep for over a year, scribbles angrily and almost incoherently, and it's quite hard to read his script because you could tell how pissed off he is. They can go any place, he writes. If anyone else can get them, let them go ahead and do it. Then he raged that his muzzled dogs were poisoned. 
A.S. Sharp, the other hunter, pursued sheep long after his contract expired. In fact, his commitment to catch sheep exploded into a crazed obsession. Recognizing this during the winter of 1902, the zoo superintendent suggests, as you now have been engaged in this undertaking for a year, maybe this isn't worth your while, with an ellipsis at the end. Sharp ignores the advice. He rambles the mountain for years and actually will make headlines all over the West for being a crazy sheep seeker. The campaign to catch mountain sheep proved arduous. The entire mountain sheep affair may have been the most sustained effort in history by the United States government to procure a single species for the purpose of zoological display. By the spring of 1902, Frank Baker had grown extremely anxious. The citizens of Colorado had at the same time begun to demand that their state monitor its cherished animals. State governments in some ways began to enforce conservation laws. C.W. Harris, the commissioner of game and fish in Colorado, told Baker that People in the state are getting very angry at your department on account of capture permits. I just received a letter stating where a man had a permit to capture one, but killed 11 and ended up with none. Letters like these are oh so common in 19th century conservation writing. Wyoming also increased its surveillance. Only the governor can now issue permits, and DeForest Richards surely would not do it because his constituents held their mountain sheep deer. They were symbols of the state. In a letter from Secretary Langley explicitly blamed the states for the, the failure of the national government in procuring sheep in the first place. Then on April 11, 1902, a second sheep arrives miraculously on the doorstep of the zoo. Like the first, this sheep was owned previously by a resident of western Colorado. Hearing word of Baker's desire for sheep, his name's Mr. Dusenberry decided to sell his pet mountain sheep. Harris reluctantly granted the permit, and Baker realized that from now on, it would no longer be advisable to ask further privileges of Colorado. This was it. At the end of 1902, four years after the chase commenced, two Rocky Mountain sheep shared an exhibit in the nation's capital. Despite the adventures sparked by the Smithsonian Institution, these particular sheep fenced upon the Rocky Hill next to the Audad enclosure were unremarkably obtained through everyday Americans who quietly domesticated the animals that the federal government pursued around its supposedly conquered frontier. Wild sheep, tamed by wild Americans, ironically, provided the National Zoo with pets that told the story of nation taming the wild. Because this lie laid it, lay hidden behind its curation, though, these two mountain sheep allowed the zoo and the United States to lay claim to the modernity of mastery pursued by nation states all over the world. Indeed, during the first decade of the 20th century, national power proved more chimerical than textbook narratives of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era may suggest. Despite the failed populist movement of the 1890s, despite American victory in the Spanish-American War, Despite Teddy Roosevelt's big stick diplomacy and despite the display of mastery exhibited by neatly arranged zoo enclosures, the state, with a capital S, remained far from omnipotent. Within the space of the zoo, power appears neat and tidy. A zoogoer could observe North American mountain sheep in one enclosure, walk a few steps, and then view the wild sheep of North Africa in another enclosure, walk a few more steps and see the wild sheep of Northeastern Spain. A zoogor could assume that the United States had conquered, in order to save, the ovis ungulates of the world. The display of the zoo, however, masked the true story of hunters, locals, governments, permits, policies, public opinions, and failures. Undoubtedly, over the course of the 19th century, the state grew in both size and power. Over the same time span, an amateur tradition of natural history collecting gave way to professionalized trades and animals businesses in dealing plants, and businesses in de dealing in with environmental artifacts of all sorts. Nonetheless, these well-known transitions fail to tell the whole story. In mountain sheep harvesting, many actors diffused throughout the federal system and spread across American society exercised the power, or a lack thereof, that influenced both the national government and the business of animal collecting. Since by 1902, it was common knowledge that mountain sheep were impossible to acclimate, no one expected the pair to live very long. And actually, the guidebook to the zoo actually says these sheep won't live very long. It's a very plainly stated in the guidebook given to zoo goers. Indeed, the first sheep died in January 1903, killed by intestinal parasites that thrive at low altitudes. 
The second sheep apparently lived for several years, and I could not find any record about uh, when the second sheep uh, died. The National Zoological Park, however, did not cease pursuing bighorns after the first pair's procurement. The quest continues well after World War I. Wild Westerners chased bighorns for the Smithsonian until 1930. A few sheep arrived at the zoo. A few sheep died at the zoo. Most of the sheep absconded to the, the unreachable heights of the Rocky Mountains. As late as 1917, Richard Rathbun, he's acting secretary of the Smithsonian at this time, told Texas Senator Morris Shepard, who was trying to find a sheep for San Antonio Zoo, that the wild sheep is among the most difficult of animals to acclimatize. That same year, Frank Baker purchases a mountain sheep from a young Mohab boy in South Dakota for 10 bucks, which is only 6% of the rate uh, for bighorns, to speak of exploitation. Like much of the history of the American West, the intertwined stories of early zoological parks and mountain sheep twist around the theme of exploitation, familiar to both the historiography of the American West and contemporary criticisms of zoological parks. No matter what zoos are today, Gilded Age and Progressive Era zoo building indeed exploited both humans and animals alike. Exploitation, of course, surrounded every zoo enclosure, from capture to transport, from containment to curation, from display to consumption, every life in the zoo, sheep included, embodied literally human dominion over the non-human, over nature, over the exotic. Exploitation made the tableau of mastery etched into the very purpose of the zoo movement possible in the first place. Yet, seeing zoological parks and its animals through the lens of exploitation only gets at the surface of their complicated histories. Historians rely on standard power-laden categories of analysis, things like nation, empire, modernity, industrialization, race, the exotic. And these have only put zoos into interpretive straitjackets. They overemphasize singular meanings bestowed upon the institution and all the animals in that institution, but they ignore the multitudinous meanings born within that institution. Tracking historical animals will not only give voice to the silenced, but will also gesture towards new analytical crossroads. It will also show why zoos are important. Zoos have much to say. Several historical lessons cling with these mountain sheep to the cliffs and canyons of North America. First, as the Smithsonian Institution chased sheep, it wove together a body of zoological knowledge about these mysterious animals. This knowledge emanated not from the new laboratories of scientists. This knowledge came not from naturalists in the field, this knowledge arrived from the heavens, pieced together by North Americans who ventured to those heavens, who climbed those vertical cliffs. In many ways, these individuals appeared as the archetypal characters of Western myth, cowboys, hunters, adventurers, wild mountain men. <clears throat> However, in their role as sheep chasers, it was through their failures. It was through their failures that both zoological knowledge was built from the ground up and the American West was built from peaks down. Even though a few systematic zoologists had tried classifying the many types of mountain sheep, in 1922, a Milwaukee hunter declared, quote, the books are very confused and misleading. Ned Hollister, a later zoo superintendent, admitted that the sheep have never been thoroughly studied as yet, and the relationship between the forms are imperfectly known. The Americans that lived among bighorns could give a shit about the Aristotelian forms. They could care less about centuries of taxonomy, but they knew the sheep best. Like the sheep, knowledge could not be captured. It had to be assembled by a network of unlikely actors brought together by government, economics, human culture, zoological parks, and most important, sheep resistance. Zoos were essential to the creation of popular zoological thought, and they were very important to challenging Americans to think about the animal enclosed in more complex ways. And this is another irony of zoos. You take a single anim animal, you enclose it, put it on display, which seems quite simple. It may be flattening, but for those observing that animal, it opens up new ways of seeing. Zoos, even in their failure, subsidized the creation of zoology, and then it amplified this zoology in and for the public. The second lesson, extinction and conservation cannot only be viewed dialectically. During the two decades before and after 1900, as environmentalism spread throughout the West, zoological parks and their animals gained a new significance. They became symbols of conservation, 
embodying the very things that the modernizing, largely white, largely urban, largely upper middle class, largely progressive world thought was disappearing around them. Zoo animals in this way became an Eden of sorts, a land before time in the imagination of those surrounded by the quagmire of capitalism and the second industrial revolution. In this way, zoos and its animals functioned as psychological escapes. Zoos came to be viewed as refuges for species facing extinction. The animals value not only for their exoticness, but also for their rarity and their vulnerability. On these intellectual grounds, endangered animals found homes in zoos. American zoos especially sought to save North American animals. Not only these bighorns, but also elk and beavers, condors, bison, moose, mule deer, black-tailed deer, passenger pigeons, caribou, antelope, manatees, mountain goats, grizzly bears, the list goes on and on. They want to save these, zoos from these animals from annihilation. Ironically, though, as with mountain sheep, many of these campaigns in the short term often endangered the very species they sought to save. The historical irony of zoo conservation, or the one showcased here since this talks not about display itself, is that the project of saving species often put individual animals in peril. Conservation was as rooted in economies of desire as in economies of nature or capitalism. Even though the National Zoo and other zoos hoped to protect mountain sheep, the process of catching them inevitably caused high casualties. And this held true for most animals, antelope, sea anemones, bison, and sometimes zoos failed completely. Some species' last representatives or endlings, we saw the thylacine a minute earlier, the passenger pigeon, the quagga, the Carolina parakeet, the heath hen, died in the confines of zoos. In the long term, though, over the course of the 20th century, zoo-sponsored conservation campaigns reduced their recklessness. Conservation did, indeed, as, as we all know, become more conservation-minded. The point of this essay is that the conservation rhetoric of zoos as does all rhetoric for all missions, for all institutions, often erase the complexities, the ironies, the hypocrisies, the complications, and the animals from conservation history. Furthermore, individual zoos, individual animals, individual species, specific enclosures, all have unique histories and stories that need to be examined on a case-by-case -case basis. The story of mountain sheep in the National Zoo may be quite different than the story of the rhinoceros in the Berlin Zoo. Or, or maybe it's not. History and science must be concerned with particulars, not with discourse. And regarding the mountain sheep affair, all of these actors and forces lay hidden behind the stories of mastery told on the surface of zoos. Between 1870 and 1910, zoological parks appeared at the heart of every major American city. In this time span, these institutions sold tens of millions of tickets. By the beginning of the 21st century, historians realize the historical significance of zoos. Yet still, they are buying into the straitjackets that are often put on zoos, narratives about nationhood and globalization. These narratives were and are important. The problem, though, is that they are constructed by society and inscribed upon the bodies of zoo animals after they are put on display. While these narratives speak volumes about past societies and cultures, they tend to homogenize real, historical, breathing, non-human animals. These narratives tended to focus, focus on discursive, metonymic, symbolic animals, not the living animal before us. They tend to ignore the lives of animals before they arrive in zoos. They tend to ignore the complex processes that brought animals to zoos in the first place. And they tend to ignore most of the humans who surrounded, lived with, and coexisted and experienced animals on a day-to-day -day basis. More than 50 zoological parks, thousands of zoo employees, millions of zoo animals, and tens of millions of zoo goers exploded onto the historical scene during the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. Each of these actors have unique and complicated stories to tell for historians who realize that zoos are influential institutions. They're influential to environmentalism, politics, science, popular culture, economics, humanistic philosophy, museums, taxidermy, medicine, animal rights discourse. I mean, the list goes on and on. Zoos were everywhere and are everywhere. Sheep survived. Since the beginning of the 19th century, the population of Ovis canadensis has declined from more than 1.5 million to somewhere around 70,000 today. Nonetheless, due to conservation efforts and sheep resilience, 
Mountain sheep numbers have been on the rise since the National Zoological Park first began this sheep chasing episode at the dawn of the 20th century. Mountain sheep still face challenges that threaten existence. A recent resurgence in mountain lion populations, for example, subsidized on local cattle have put mountain sheep um, in harm's way. Although there's this competing conservation struggle between uh, advocates for mountain sheep and advocates for uh, bighorn sheep. Americans are still pressing against the range and habitat of mountain sheep in myriad ways. Surface mining, urbanization, hiking trails, livestock grazing, etc. For zoological parks, mountain sheep continued to resist for most of the 20th century, remaining difficult to locate, capture, transport, and keep in captivity. Occasionally, a mountain sheep would arrive at a zoo, either unpredictably or after prolonged adventures, just like the one told. Frequently, though, at least until the late 1980s, their lives were short in zoos and probably sad in zoos. In the 1970s, zoological parks first began to breed sheep in captivity, and this is a major moment, a major shift in zoo practice, philosophy, and technology, sidestepping many of the logistical difficulties in actually catching the sheep themselves. In 1980, for example, according to International Zoo Yearbook, 23 zoological parks scattered around the world held 106 mountain sheep. Of these, though, 84 were bred in captivity. Yep, captive breeding has its own problems, it introduces its new threats into captive herds. Reductions in viability, decreases in fertility, increases in mortality, and less genetic variability. Zoos do not release captive bred sheep into the wild as they do with other species. Sheep born in zoos, they stay in, their zoo, in zoos, and their offspring stays in zoos as well. We can think of these sheep maybe as something separate from Ovis candensis. In conclusion, they deserve a history that analyzes them as biopolitical products of the Anthropocene. They also deserve stories told that locate their voices from the crags of our past and present. At least 159 mountain sheep live in zoos today. While none live in the National Zoo, what this story was about, mountain sheep can be found in Los Angeles, Calgary, Edmonton, San Diego, Phoenix, Denver. Tens of thousands of resilient others still stretch from northern Canada to northern Mexico. They still bind a continent together, living above the perception of most 21st century Americans. Thanks. Oh, and I just want to show, uh, this is uh, two books in, in zoo history, if you're interested. The Animal States, the first classic. The Nature of the Beast is a very recent book about the Tokyo Zoo. And Through the Lion Gate is a just published last month, wonderful cultural history about the Berlin Zoo in Nazi Germany. Um, and lastly, if you're interested in, in biology, The Wild Within uh, just came out as well. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Do you want to oh, take I'd love to. Is that great? I went too long. No. Any questions? I love these bighorns, so I'm happy to. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions at all? Well, I'll just ask. So thanks, thanks for your talk. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. I think I missed the. the origin story for why they were trying to capture the, the bighorn sheep. Uh, was it just for a zoological display, or was there other motivations behind it? Yeah, so it was for zoological display, but the larger purpose was the National Zoo wanted to preserve all of uh, the United States uh, animals in peril. And so they brought in... Or they were categorized. As yeah, animals. what we would call endangered. Yeah. And the mountain sheep were, was on the list, and they hadn't had it yet. Okay. So that sparked the campaign. Yeah. So uh, you never mentioned the Museums of Natural History and their collections. How much, how predominant were they in their collection patterns prior to this time? Yeah, um, well, that's a good question. So the National Zoo actually emerges from the National Museum. Um, it, the Department of Living Animals um, is used as ta uh, by taxidermists in the museum, um, and then it mutates or gets morphed into the zoo after congressional debate. Um, the collecting patterns for the National Museum uh, line up very uh, neatly with the same collection patterns as the zoo and often the exact same individuals that would collect artifacts from the museum or carcasses for taxidermy would be the same individuals that would try to gather living entities. Um, the issue is that it's much easier to collect dead entities than living ones so uh, many of these collectors will quickly say well I'll collect from the museum I'm not going to collect living mountain sheep with booby traps I mean it's much harder. Uh, but the patterns are similar, and the places are similar. Yeah. So my understanding is that, like with elephants, that uh, there was a relationship between the zoos and the museums. That the museums would get 
the bones and oh so yes. On. And at the zoos, are actually <clears throat> so in one story I read, I guess it must have been the Chinese book was about like the zoo selling wallets made from the elephant skin, right? Yes. Elephants, and so I'm wondering if something similar was going on with the sheep. Then, like not that there was that many, I suppose, in captivity, but the ones that did die in captivity, were they were they shipped off? Yeah, almost. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, almost every zoo animal in any zoo, not just in the United States, not just in Canada, but also in Europe, any animal that's rare, unique, or exotic, as soon as it dies, there's bidding wars on the carcass. I mean, museums want, want the taxidermy. Yeah. Um, parts of the animals will be turned into wallets and sold at high prices. Um, by 1910, even the byproducts of the animals would be bid on by hospitals. So, for example, primate blood in 1910 was a hot commodity. If a gorilla would die in a zoo, um, or a chimpanzee more likely, um, that blood would be a hot commodity and you know, all the local hospitals will try to get it to run tests on it. Um, I mean, really, everything that has to do with any sort of dead animal was also a commodity. So all zoo animals have these very interesting afterlives. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Any right. other questions? I think yeah, okay. the there, so that sounds good. Thanks.